Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 31st January 2020. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party Research Director Robert Barwick. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Elisa. And on today's show, we have cash ban agenda blowing up in government's face and the latest WMD lie exposed. So firstly, cash ban agenda blowing up in government's face. Robbie, yes. you've just gotten back from attending the second hearing on the government's uh, legislation, which would have been in law had we not and other parties not interrupted its um, uh, rush to be legislated. It did yep. pass the House of Representatives last year, but it was forced into a Senate committee, and that committee has held two lots of hearings, one in on the 12th December last year, and the other one just occurred on Thursday. Now, I understand there was quite a bit of blowback against what the government's proposing at these hearings. Absolutely. Actually, uh, you can you see the way these hearings have gone. You see why the government really does like to ram legislation through undetected. Mm -hmm. Because when there's a proper attention brought to bear on these kinds of laws, um, it blows up in the government's face. And that's what it happened on the 12th of December and it definitely happened again yesterday. Um, there was a because there was advance notice this time that the hearing was on, the room was packed. There was probably space for 50 people. They had to squeeze in close to 80 people, right? And, and that made a big impression on the senators, let me assure you. Um, and then the test, the, the, the witnesses were, there was, a, there was a fewer number of witnesses than on the 12th of December. They let the Treasury and ATO come back and have a second crack because if you saw the footage of, of Treasury and ATO at the first hearing, they were a disaster. Right, so they were allowed to try and um, appear to be better across the, their brief on this, um, but it didn't work because even they even they were still vague on the details of this law, and it, this is a law that was supposed to have been enforced on the first of January, and they still can't explain it properly on the thirtieth of, of, of January. That's when the hearing was held, and so I was looking at the two Labor senators at this hearing, Senator McAllister and Senator Kimberly Kitching, that because that's the key. If Labor um, rolls over and refuses to oppose the government on this, this is going to be law. If Labor votes against it, we can stop this. That's the bottom line here, right? That's, that's the equation. And what we've seen now in two hearings in a row is Labor is incredibly sceptical, right? And what they got from the actual testimony would not have convinced them at all mm. as the virtues of this bill. And it, it possibly would have been, um, you know, we were slightly worried that it wouldn't have gone as well because Senator Alex Gallagher, who had chaired the previous yep. hearing and was determined to get to some answers, and people have probably seen that footage yep. we put together, a short five-minute video of some of the best clips, uh, is unfortunately unwell and had to withdraw from the hearing. But Senator uh, Kitchen, Kitching. Kitching, Kimberly Kitching from the ALP, took over that role and did an excellent job. And she'd put out a tweet ahead of time saying that she'd taken over uh, that position and must have spoken to him, presumably, uh, and had to adopted yep. that spirit and, and even suggested that this was a bad law by a bad government ahead of the hearings. And she came in with that, with that point of view and she was, you know, there's an element in politics where the two major parties score points off each other. I've been surprised that Labor hasn't been scoring points off the government on this. Mm. Senator Kitching did yesterday repeatedly. She kept whacking at him, and so she should, right? Even if that's her motivation, so she should, because this is a terrible law. And she, she put out that tweet, and then she put out this follow-up tweet um, asking for more feedback on the law, right? And finally, this is starting to... More and more Labor people are starting to get in their heads that the public don't want this. Um, I have to pay tribute to John Adams. Now... You know, we talk about John a lot on this show. We've, we've paid his clips. I've, I've interviewed him here. You've got to appreciate the weight of expectation <laughs> that was on John. You know, he was the only person that in among the thousands of Australians that have really mobilised against the bill, he was the only person and, and made those submissions. He was the only person actually called to give testimony, sort of representing that section of the community. And a lot of expectation on him. He did absolutely brilliantly. And his, his testimony alone, I, we're not going to play most of it because um, it's too long, but... I urge people to go to the interests of the People YouTube channel and watch the whole thing mm. because that testimony alone from beginning to end is, is an excellent summary in one place of everything that's wrong with this law, mm. right? It's worth watching. But let's play a clip mm. of John um, from his uh, testimony and then Senator Kitching's reaction to and him. Kitching had previously read out 
oh, the yeah. motion to a Liberal Party. Um, well, when the Liberal Party last year in Victoria here had their had their um, their meeting, their big meeting, and uh, Steve Holland moved a motion against the cash ban, it had more than ninety five percent support. And Kimberly Kitchie learned that yesterday, and she made a big deal about that. She read the whole motion yeah. out, right? Um, that w that got such overwhelming support. It was her way of bashing the government, saying your your own supporters, your own party members hate this law. Mm. And then John was able to respond to that. And then um, yeah, so just listen to this clip. Again, I, I, my view is the government hasn't done its homework on this. They've come, they've come up with a bit of a rush law, quite ill-considered, a um, lot of negative impacts, not a lot of benefits. Um, and, and, you know, uh, the government is trying to push this through. Um, and, and, you know, what, one, one of the risks is, so there's quite a few Australians who are aware of this law. There's a lot of, there's millions of Australians who have no idea that the parliament's considering this law. And so uh, if this law does pass, and millions of Australians do find out that this is now the law, uh, I would say that the economic but also the political repercussions of this would be more significant than what that potentially Parliament is thinking at the moment. Well, I think one of the attendees at the Victorian Liberal Council meeting said, I have a simple message for the Treasurer and the Assistant Treasurer, get out of my wallet. <laughs> and do you think... <laughs> Now, just apologise to the viewers, Elisa. There's no video from yesterday because I only video the um, the hearings that are held in Parliament. This one was outside of Parliament, so it's just audio. So sorry about that. But let's take a break because there's, I've got another clip that I want people to hear. That was a real defining moment in the hearings as well. Welcome back to the Citizens Report where we're discussing the latest round of cash ban hearings. And uh, before we go to this next clip, Robert, um, Aaron Patrick from the Australian Financial Review who was at the hearings ran an article in the AFR yesterday, The Big Bank Theory Against Cash. And of course he defined it again as a conspiracy theory and he said that that conspiracy theory is now being propelled along by senators. He reviewed John Adams' Um, presentation. Yep. He said, you know, he was given a platform to put forward this conspiracy theory. Given um, a platform. Shock <laughs> horror that someone not approved by the banker's toilet paper gets yeah. to testify before Parliament. He was given a platform. Oh my stars. But he did note the support for Adams, including by the audience, and he noted that a campaign by right-wing groups, including the extremist Citizens Electoral Council, has been remarkably effective at raising awareness of a change few people had heard of. And he also noted that Kimberly Kitching yeah. gleefully read the Liberal motion into the record that we mentioned before at Thursday's committee hearing. Well, this was a very dishonest article for two reasons. One is John went out of his way to bring a heap of official reports, including by the IMF, on the central thing that Patrick calls a conspiracy theory, which is that um, cash is being banned to, to help make negative interest rates work. And John had all that documentation there and he gave it to Aaron Patrick and he <laughs> still called it a conspiracy theory and didn't acknowledge that he had that documentation. He hasn't read it yet. Completely dishonest. This is not a, this is not a newspaper. The Fin Review is not a newspaper. It is a PR rag for banks, right? And that's what Patrick was doing there. The other thing is, I have to say this, he was a liar when it came to, came to the... Uh, flight Centre testimony because Flight Centre was concerned about the impact it's going to have on them and he called their testimony dodgy, right? And all it was, there was an honest mistake that the Flight Centre witness uh, made and he corrected it straight away and Patrick knows that and he called it dodgy, mm. right? To make it to, to, to fit better in his article. These people have no credibility whatsoever. But Elisa, let's move from the bad Patrick to the good Patrick because Senator Rex Patrick was there again as he had been in the first hearing. I want people to listen to this. This was... Patrick is, Senator Rich Patrick is, has a real aversion to this law and he, he, he's looking from the standpoint of, you know, natural justice as much as anything. And he, he interrupted the proceedings when, when Treasury and the ATA were testifying again. He went off on a tangent, but it was the right tangent to go off, right? And basically, he wanted Treasury to know, and I want you to just listen to the dynamic here, and this is where the audience started getting involved as well, right? They'd been very respectful yeah. throughout the day. Um, only, the only time they'd participate is they applauded John. Um, but the audience gets involved in this. Listen to this clip of Rex Patrick putting the acid on the ATO mm. of where's the real tax evasion in Australia? Um, so this question goes to other areas where you, where you could gain from, uh, from uh, uh, enforcement rather than perhaps this area. 
you know, the, it's about the Parliament looking and saying how do we balance off where the effort of, of public effort should be applied. Now, I've looked at the tax transparency data for uh, that that you now publish um, lawfully, and that's a good thing. Uh, there are uh, at least 204 companies across Australia who have, uh, over the last five tra tax transparency years, uh, generated more than $800 billion of, tax re of, of revenue and not paid a cent in tax. Okay, so uh, you're doing something over here, you're proposing to do something over here, yet I think most Australians would find that a most unbelievable uh, circumstances, $800 billion. <laughs> I'm not sure there's a question there that can no, no, be no, answered. I'm, I'm, I'm but coming to the question, so I'm, I want to I want to get some understanding of the effort you're putting into that part of of, of tax uh, tax avoidance because I, I can't see how these companies are operating because most companies they can have a loss, but you would expect them to uh, at some stage generate a profit. Uh, I think you you're, you're drawing a very long bow away from this legislation. I'm happy to well it's let, let the Officials answer that if they think that they can, well, but chair, uh, um, it, it, you know, it's, it's, I'm it's one a long vote, way from this legislation. I'm one vote, or in fact, two two votes in the Senate deciding whether or not we not, put this not into take, to, to to legislation. So not take Sterling for granted, are you? <laughs> um, he, he's generally with me, so. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, look, I'm, I'm happy. I, I uh, genuinely, I'll take this note, genuinely, take I, I, I think it is stretching sure. the bonds of the scope of this legislation. I'm happy for the official no, no, I'm no, order. I'm order. I want to know what you are doing uh, in addition to just simply receiving a tax return. Amcor Limited, $16 billion in the manufacturing sector, no tax paid over the last five years. Um, BAE Systems in the defence sector, $6 billion dollars um, of revenue over uh, five years, no tax paid, not a cent of corporate tax paid. Uh, uh, I'll give you a couple, a few more just from different sectors. Um, Exxon Mobil, $42 billion, these are rounded down, um, of, uh, of revenue, no corporate tax paid. Uh, Ford Motor Company, $14 billion in the transport sector, um, uh, no tax paid. Couple more. Vodafone, Hutchison, Australia, eighteen billion dollars of revenue in the communications sector, no tax paid. Wilmar, Australia Holdings Limited, eight billion dollars in revenue over the last five year, uh, tax transparency years. It's in the sugar industry, no tax paid. Um, I'd like you on notice to come back to the committee and say for each of those companies I've named, these are the enforcement. Or you know, we've we've looked at these companies in these ways. Over those over those five years, and to be very clear, I'm not asking for what the results of them of those that information is. I want to know what you, uh, the tax office, has, has done in respect of that tax revenue that is not being collected. Certainly, certainly happy to help with that. I think possibly even the um, the uh, the confirmation of a particular uh, taxation interaction with any of those entities of itself. Is a potential breach of the secrecy provisions. Well, I actually regard it as a very important oversight um, process, and the tax commissioner and I have run, run up against each other. Uh, and if I need to take to a Senate chamber to get uh, an order, and I, I need to f twist the government's arm, um, and I don't mind if you return that information to the committee in confidence. It's a government-controlled committee. Uh, I'd, I'd hope that 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 sort of information is not. Breaching any privacy absolutely, laws. Absolutely, we'll do everything we it's can to satisfy your question. It's oversight of the tax office, understanding what you're doing about all these companies that don't pay tax. I, I'm, I'm in no way saying it's not a legitimate question, Senator Patrick. I think it's a little bit outside the scope of this inquiry. No, it's However, no, it's not. order. So you can, you know, I think every viewer understanding well that that is the real issue. There's, there's tens of billions of dollars in real tax that's avoided, helped by KPMG, the organisation most responsible for this law, mm. and Rex Patrick is the guy who's raising that. And of course, the government representative, the chairman, is trying to um, d downplay that. But the public, you know, 
uh, help make sure that was able to be read into the, into the uh, testimony. So just quickly, very important, we have probably a week and a half to make sure this sticks on the Labor Party. It comes down to the Labor Party. So I urge everybody, don't stop um, activating, right? You have called all your Labor senators in your state. If you need their contact details, call us, we'll, we'll get them to you. All the Labor senators in your state and call them again and call them again. Make sure, they, make sure they've seen this testimony, right? Make sure they use the five minute video we produced, which you can get a copy of from the last testimony. It's call them, call them, call them. They must oppose this bill. We've got 14 days roughly, or a bit less, 10 days to make sure they get that point. And particularly by the 7th of February when the um, committee hands down their report. Yeah. So we'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. The latest WMD lie exposed. Now we're talking about Syria here and if you would go to Wikipedia or any of those other authorities you would see that on the 7th of April 2018 in Douma, Syria, there was a chemical weapons attack carried out by the Syrian army killing around 50 people. Uh, and that lie has been carried along and perpetuated by the well, media. That claim was the basis for a, a, a missile strike on Syria conducted by the United States, the United Kingdom and France. Yes. Right? Because you cannot let a chemical attack, which is a crime against humanity, a special category of war crime, etc., you cannot get, let it go unchallenged. This was their excuse. Exactly. Now, it has been definitively disproven that this never occurred. Uh, yet, the media, as we'll talk about in a moment, has not reported that whatsoever, um, or barely anyway. Uh, so the former OPCW inspector, that's the Organisation for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, Ian Henderson, has just testified to the United Nations Security Council that what his team found on the ground when they went into Syria, went into Douma, was completely different than what, than what appeared in the final report the, of the fact-finding mission. Yep. Um, so on 20th of January, he told the UN that the findings in the final FFM report were contradictory, were a complete turnaround with what the team had understood collectively during and after the Douma deployments. So he asserted that their findings of the team on the ground were changed by leadership within the OPCW. Now, along with whistleblower disclosures that were put out by WikiLeaks late last year, uh, this definitively shows that there was no chemical attack whatsoever. Um, the, the issue here, Elisa, apart from the fact that... There's, well, there's two issues. One is, this is, was a deliberate lie. What he's, what he's blowing the whistle on is that what happened in 2018... The claims were a deliberate lie. Now, in Iraq, with the weapons of mass destruction claims that led to the Iraq war, when those weapons weren't found, all the mainstream parties in those countries, like Australia, United States, United Kingdom, said, oh, yeah, but we thought they were there. It was mistake in intelligence. Mm. No. At the time, we said, garbage, that was a deliberate lie. These people... and But see, you're not supposed to be... You're not supposed to believe that people in our governments would be prepared to lie deliberately. It's right? another conspiracy. That's a conspiracy. Well, so, but, you know, I've always um, known there was a deliberate lie. There's plenty of evidence of that if people are prepared to look. This, this is absolutely clear cut, right? That, the, 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 the OPCW, which was the organisation that's responsible for finding the evidence of this, sent in a team that included this man, this British guy, and that team did not find the evidence of what people were claiming that was, that was being used within days to, as a pretext for a missile strike. And... Um, Instead of having an honest report, he's now able to reveal all this time later that the report was changed for political reasons. It's a deliberate mm. lie. That's the first issue. The second issue here is the media, because the media has not reported this at all. And that's where um, we want to play this clip. Yeah, this is Peter Hitchens, who's put together a short video. Um, he, of course, writes for the Mail on Sunday in the United Kingdom. And, uh, well, we'll just... So it's really the only... The, what he's, he's reporting for his publication, which is a mainstream media publication... We'll put that up. It's really the only media, mainstream media that's reporting it because mm. he uses his reputation as a very experienced, well-known journalist, right? Um, and he's got this 
platform, and he, he obviously defies his own editors sometimes to assist he gets some mm. of these articles up, but it's a standalone among the rest of the international media. And this is what he had to say about the real risk of running into another world war if journalists and the media keep this up. Everybody knows that the weapons of mass destruction, which was supposed to be the excuse for the Iraq war in 2003, were never found. They didn't exist. But if that happened now, do you think you'd know that the weapons of mass destruction had never been found and didn't exist? Because you probably wouldn't. What's happened to the media and what's happened to politics in the 17 years since the Iraq war means that stuff of this kind simply doesn't come out anymore. It's now several weeks since I published in the Mail on Sunday an astonishing story about how inspections of a supposed poison gas attack in Douma, Syria in April 2018 show that it was very unlikely there had been any such poison gas attack. And do you know what? Hardly a single newspaper, news agency or broadcasting organisation has followed up that devastating story. And it's very important because that alleged chemical weapons attack was used as a pretext for a missile attack on Syria by Britain, France and the USA. So while this action is specifically about deterring the Syrian regime, it will also send a clear signal to anyone else who believes they can use chemical weapons with impunity. And the agency which is involved could one day be vitally involved in deciding whether we go to war on another occasion. And the whole thing, hugely important, remains largely unknown to millions of people who ought to know. I think this is very worrying. Last week, Ian Henderson, one of the inspectors of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, who has raised doubts about this claim of a poison gas attack, appeared before the Security Council at the United Nations and gave his evidence explaining those doubts. And do you know how many newspapers and news organizations have covered that event? Precisely none. You should be more worried about what you're being told and about what you're not being told. Lisa, to me, the most striking thing about what Peter Hitchens says there is he's, he's, he's identifying that the media today is worse than 20 years ago mm. when it came to the report in the Iraq war. There were at least some mainstream media outlets in the United States like Knight Ritter that, that questioned the intelligence. Nobody, except for a handful of individuals now, is questioning these claims, right? But it's been absolutely proven true. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> one of the greatest dangers in this particular situation and with various other um, conflagration points blowing up is that there isn't a very high level of dialogue um, no. at all uh, between the major superpowers, between the nuclear powers, particularly the United States and Russia, also China and other parties such as the uh, UK and France, etc. So a very important intervention was just made by Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, where he was speaking at the Holocaust, a Holocaust memorial event for the 75th anniversary in Jerusalem on the 23rd of January, and he called for the permanent five members of the UN Security Council, which is the US, UK, France, Russia and China, who played together a crucial role in ending World War II, to come together in a summit uh, to begin to collaborate against the present dangers that are facing the world. Now, China and France have already heartily agreed to this, and there are signs from the United States uh, that the Trump administration will be open to that proposal. But of course, the mainstream American politics will try and sabotage it at all costs, like they've done this inclination of Trump's for the last three years. Yeah, we don't have um, a lot of time to go into the detail, but you can read more about it. It's a it. good initiative. It's the sort of thing the world really needs. Absolutely. And there are signs, as I said, that it will go forward quite soon. So you can read more about it in the alert. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Robert. Thanks. Tune in again next week. Mm -hmm.